Welcome to our next video for STAT 420. In this video, we're going to really get started with chapter 15, I guess, because the last video was more a review. Um, we're going to talk about multicollinearity in modeling. Um, so multicollinearity kind of comes from collinearity, which is just a term which means that um, um, we have linear combinations. Um, so if two variables are collinear with one another, it means that um, one is just a linear combination of the other, and knowing one means that I can exactly um, predict the other. So we're going to kind of set up an example. We're going to set up um, this exact collinearity situation in a model where I have some response variable y, um, and then I have x1 is some normally distributed variable, x2 is another normally distributed variable with its own distribution, and then x3 is literally just a linear combination of x1 and x2, meaning that all I that I can um, just you know mimic or recreate x3 by knowing these other two variables. So as a result, when I think about modeling y, this is actually adding nothing into this model. Um, x3 will be correlated with y because it's just a linear combination of variables that are correlated with y but it has no new information to provide into this model. It is not helping me predict y better because it's just the same information. Um, so what happens if I have exact collinearity and I try to fit a model in R um, with those predictors, R is actually not going to know what to do um, with that um, additional redundant variable. Uh, meaning that whichever variable comes last, that's just a linear combination of what's already been seen. Um, the least squares method can't fit a coefficient to that because it's just redundant. There is no, like I could, I could put any coefficient um, and it wouldn't matter because it's just a redundant variable where this is literally all the information I have already. Um, so this is not really a situation that happens very often realistically. Um, unless you just really do something dumb, um, like try to fit a model where you have temperature in Fahrenheit and temperature in Celsius as, as two separate predictors, right? Because if you know one, well, you know the other, and those both together are not adding unique contributions to that model because one is, they're, they're just both measuring temperature just in different units. Um, so, so unless you're doing that, um, you're probably not going to encounter exact collinearity um, when modeling. But what you will um, encounter is just general collinearity where there is, you know, close collinearity or, you know, high collinearity, however you want to kind of call it here. Um, we usually just call it multicollinearity, um, where the multi just comes from this term multiple regression, that we're, we're doing regression with multiple predictors and we have collinearity between predictors, um, but not necessarily exact or perfect collinearity. So whenever two or more predictors in a model are highly correlated with one another, and our prediction of the response is not meaningfully imp improved by using um, more than one of those predictors, then I have multicollinearity. So as an example, uh, maybe I have height and I have arm length as two separate predictors in the model to predict someone's brain mass. Um, well, height and arm length are highly correlated variables, meaning that actually your height and your arm length are going to be extremely close measures, um, they, that, that they are not only very correlated, they're also just very close, though it doesn't, that's not really a, a necessity, you know, they don't necessarily have to be close in value as much as just knowing one gives me a very good estimate of what the other one is going to be. Um, so if I'm using both of those to predict brain mass, it's probably kind of redundant to do so because I'm probably not getting a whole lot of extra information um, out of the other if I already have one. Another example might be your monthly rent or mortgage payment and your monthly food expenses. Um, that those are probably fairly correlated variables. Um, and if I'm trying to predict someone's annual income, it may not be necessary to have both. I mean, I'm not gonna say it definitely isn't necessary, um, but I do imagine those are two um, fairly highly correlated variables. So, so maybe I don't need both of them, um, but I guess it just depends. We'd have to look at the data to know for sure. Um, so how do we identify when we have highly correlated predictors, when we have multicollinearity in the model? 
Um, so one way is to create a uh, correlation matrix of all relevant variables to see if any of our variables have correlations close to negative one or one, because negative one would be perfect negative correlation, positive one would be perfect positive correlation. Um, so anytime we have predictors that are anywhere close to that, then maybe we don't need both of them in the model. Um, scatter plots can also be helpful too. Scatter plots of all pairs. Um, I don't. I'm not a big fan of that because I think if you have more than like five or six predictors, it's kind of hard to see them. Um, but if you have really high multicollinearity, it probably would stick out when you do that. Um, so I'm a big fan of, of the correlation matrix. I'm also a big fan of visualizing that with a uh, correlation plot, um, which I kind of have over here as an example. So, so number one, I will kind of talk about this correlation matrix. Um, so there's a function in R called core, C-O-R, which stands for correlation. And if I take the correlation of a data set um, of, you know, that contains more than one variable, um, then I can create a matrix of every variable pair into a grid like this. And I actually only need about half of this. Um, so for example, if you kind of draw a, a horizontal line down the middle better than I can, um, you'll see that those middle entries are just each variable correlated with themselves, which is why we have that diagonal of ones because each variable has perfect correlation with itself. Um, and then above that and below that, uh, that diagonal line, it's just going to be mirror images because, for example, this is publication year and height. This is also publication year and height, just with their, their positions reversed in the matrix. Um, so you're going to see that kind of mirror image where you really only have to look at one half of the correlation matrix to see all of the information that you would need. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're just looking for um, variables that might have a high correlation. And it actually turns out that um, um, the list price and Amazon price of books is extremely correlated, which I don't think is a surprise. Um, Amazon price was the variable that we were um, using as a response earlier. So, so I don't think that's necessarily a problem. Like we don't, we, we want predictors to be highly correlated with the response variable. What we're concerned about or what we wonder about is when predictors are highly correlated with one another. So I'm gonna kind of look through here and see if any of my predictors are highly correlated. Um, I don't know if any are, but here is one that actually stands out. Here's um, 0.809, and this would be number of pages in thickness. So that makes a lot of sense that the more pages in a book, the thicker the book is. So maybe those are kind of redundant to both include in a model. Maybe I'm not really gaining a whole lot of extra information uh, knowing um, one versus the other. Um, so looking through a grid of, of values may not be easy, especially if I, have, if I have a lot of variables, that's gonna be kind of hard to miss stuff. So another option here is that I could make a correlation plot um, where color codes um, uh, high correlations or really low correlations. Um, so I can kind of quickly look at this and see obviously my, uh, my ones are the diagonal here. And then I also have the Amazon price and the list price, which we talked about, obviously are going to be um, highly correlated, but that's a predictor with the response. The next highest one is probably this thickness and number of pages. So this kind of stands out a bit. Um, so maybe, you know, maybe these two variables, again, are not completely necessary to both include. So the correlation plot's really helpful there um, for seeing that. And I made this with um, a GG core plot which is um, a package inside, um, or I should say a function inside this package called ggcoreplot. So if you wanna install this and library this, then you can use this plot. I think it's also embedded, it's also intertwined with ggplot2, so it will make you library that as well. Um, but I think this is a really cool uh, function. You can also um, customize it, so you can customize the color options. You can also change the symbols. I really like the circle one, so if you change uh, oh goodness, I don't remember if it's method or size. Um, but if you go to this link right here, um, you can see a whole lot of uh, cool stuff um, that you can do with that uh, plot option if you want to kind of customize it. All right, so measuring multicollinearity. Um, so, so one way that we can kind of measure um, multicollinearity in addition to just looking at individual correlations 
that's only going to show one variable with another variable. But I'm also interested in if I have one predictor that's highly correlated or highly well predicted by the remaining set of predictors as well. So it's not just one to one, but just this variable added in comparison to everything that I already have. And so we can actually create an R squared measure for each individual predictor. And this R squared measure is the percent of variability in that predictor that's explained by all of the other predictors currently in our model. So we can do this for each predictor by just literally making a model with that particular predictor in the response position and all the other predictors um, being listed there. So basically we just kind of nix the, the response variable for a second, create a linear model um, with that particular predictor in that response spot against all the other predictors, and then just look at R squared to see what that value is. Uh, and in cases where that um, um, individual predictor's R squared is high, that means that it is well predicted. It is well correlated with the other variables that are already present. Um, and it might be then a redundant predictor to include in the model if I already have everything else. Um, or basically we just have to decide, do we wanna keep this predictor or is there another predictor that maybe we wanna to get rid of in that case? Um, and nobody can really tell you what is too high because it just depends on your needs and um, context. Um, but, but in general, you know, like if your R squared for an individual predictor is 80, 90, more than 90%, that, you know, suggests that maybe you don't need it, that you should consider um, dropping it, or at least you should reconsider if you want all of the predictors currently in your model. Um, more often, we usually kind of measure this idea with something called uh, VIF, which stands for Variance Inflation Factor. Um, and it's just kind of that R squared for the predictor um, measured in a different way. It's, it's literally the same idea, just presented in a different value. And the reason it's often presented um, in this form is because we can break down, we can decompose the variance of our beta coefficient um, into this expression in which one of those terms is this VIF measure that we're talking about. Um, so the variance inflation factor is quantifying the effect of collinearity on the variance of our regression estimates. So what we mean is um, when this measure is large, it means that the variance in our beta hat value is actually quite high, uh, meaning that there's a lot of um, variability, there's a lot of range um, in the possible beta hats that we could get. Even though it might still be centered, it should still be centered at the true beta value. Um, but our prediction could be really unreliable whenever the, the VIF is really high for that particular predictor. Um, so, and that also I just want to kind of break down how this works. So before we were saying that when this value is high, that means we have a lot of collinearity. It means that this predictor is well explained by the other predictors in the model already. So when it's in this format, one over one minus that value, uh, when this is high, that means that this whole value is also going to be high, but it's measured differently. So the minimum value here, so the, the variance inflation factor um, is going to be in some range um, from 1 to infinity, where 1 means there is no explanation from the other predictors. It means that this R squared value is 0, um, so which is probably not really going to happen. Um, but you can be pretty close to 1, uh, meaning that you can have a predictor that is not well explained by the other predictors in the model. Um, and so when that happens, um, it means that this is probably... Um, um, adding a unique contribution rather than just kind of redundant with the other predictors we already have. Um, when this value is high, oftentimes we say above 5. So, so when VIF is above 5 or so, um, then possibly a redundant predictor. It doesn't necessarily mean we need to cut it. Um, but when, when the VIF is above 5, it means that this R squared value is above 80%. It means that it is more than 80% explained by other predictors we already have. So maybe it's not offering a, a very unique contribution. 
Um, but again, it just depends on context. It depends on what we're doing. You don't necessarily need to cut it. If we're doing modeling for prediction, um, you know, we can set a higher bar because it's not so bad to have a lot of predictors and as long as we're not overfitting. Um, so, so in that case, it's not a big deal to have um, some redundant predict predictors there. All right. Um, so calculating VIF and comparing its effect. Um, so there is a VIF function, um, looks just like this. So VIF of your model will produce the variance inflation factor of all of your predictors in the model, which is very helpful for this reason. It's in the fairway package, so you'd have to library this first in order to use VIF, so just keep that in mind. Um, and so to kind of demonstrate how this works and, and what it communicates to us, I'm just gonna use the example in the chapter 15, which is trying to predict somebody's ideal seat position, how far they, they um, set their seat away from the steering wheel in a car based on different attributes of that person. And so some examples of, of um, variables that are collected here are the age of the individual, arm length, height, height with shoes on, thigh, and leg length. Um, so one thing that we might notice here, and um, I'll move myself out of the way, is, um, one is one of these variables is height, um, like just height without shoes on, and one of them is height with shoes on. And these are obviously highly correlated variables, and we can see that with the, the VIF, that the VIFs are extremely high, and that's because with one in the model, um, we have a really, really good um, estimate of the other in the model because these are extremely correlated variables, like up to, I think, R squared of over 99% here um, with each other. So for that reason, they're kind of redundant in the model. And something that you'll notice here is that the standard error for these beta coefficients is quite high for that reason, meaning that these beta coefficients could be wildly off um, because the variance inflation factor is so high um, when this happens. And that's because if you think about what the coefficient represents, is it represents the change in the response variable for every one unit increase in this predictor, given these all these other factors are holding constant. So what does it mean for height to have an effect on seat position if your height shoes value is remaining constant. Well, if these are such highly correlated variables, it's kind of meaningless because they kind of have to move together. Um, so, so it doesn't really make sense to compare someone whose height is um, two people of different heights with the same height with shoes on value. That's kind of a weird idea. Um, and so because these VIFs are so high, it's going to influence um, our estimates of these beta coefficients and they're just redundant predictors in the model. Um, and so there's a couple other predictors we could also nix as well that are gonna be pretty highly correlated, not, not like this, but relatively highly correlated. So I made a new model where I just held on to three of these variables. And we can see the VIFs are um, quite a bit more reasonable now. You'll also notice that the standard error for each of these variables is um, a bit lower, at least certainly for height. Now our standard error is like nine times lower than it was, meaning that we have a much more um, accurate beta coefficient to estimate this relationship between height and seat position. Now, um, while multicollinearity in a model does kind of hurt our beta coefficients, it doesn't necessarily hurt um, our prediction. In other words, if we have some redundant variables in the model, um, we're probably still going to make about the same prediction with or without them. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it. If they're just redundant variables, then that means they're not really changing the predictions themselves. Uh, I'm still going to make the same predictions. Um, what it does affect is the beta coefficients, being that me predicting how this variable relates to the response is gonna be a lot harder to pin down because I have these redundant predictors in the model that are kind of shuffling how those contributions get, get weighted in. Um, but the predictions themselves are gonna be very consistent regardless of which model I use. And so if I, if I look at my predictions um, without the noise, basically with the simpler model versus the more complex model, they end up lining up really, really well. Um, all right, so just kind of reviews. So when do we get concerned about multicollinearity? When do I really care about this? Uh, number one, if I have a thread of overfitting, 
um, which happens if I have a lot of terms in the model, but not necessarily a lot of observations. Um, so, so I should be cautious about just adding terms for the sake of adding terms. Um, I'd really only like to add the terms that I need as opposed to just adding redundant predictors or redundant terms that don't add anything to my model. Um, it also just becomes more difficult to use because if I have a lot of extra terms, um, then I don't want to fit variables that are harder to measure or just kind of tedious to gather. Um, so, so why make a model with 50 predictors when I could do a model that's just as good with four or five? Um, so, so it's just a lot easier to use simpler models anyway. And then specifically, if I'm modeling for explanation, um, this becomes a problem because I'm now beginning to cloud the relationship between individual variables and the response because of variance inflation. Um, my, my beta coefficient estimates can be wildly changed when I have some redundant predictors in the model. So instead, what I want to do is just pick the best one or just like the most unique contributions and get rid of the rest so that I can have much better estimates of how those variables relate to the response if that's what I'm primarily interested in doing.